The Time Machine Did It, Chapter 8 Cola was reclining on silken cushions, getting a quick touch-up from her makeup team, and last-minute instructions from her trainer, when I arrived carrying a bunch of roses and a box of candy. I hadn't realized I was so handsome before this, but according to this woman, if I heard her properly, I was a combination of Gregory Peck. She said she had to have a date with me right away, tonight, and she told me to come alone, no cops. Apparently, she felt if policemen were there, it would be hard for us to get comfortable. Cola took the roses and candy I had brought her and daintily chucked them into a huge pile of roses and candy in the corner. She folded me in her arms and said she wouldn't live without me, she couldn't live without me, which was confusing because she'd been living without me for about 36 years, by my estimate, judging by her teeth. I forced open her jaws while she was putting on some music. We sat down on the couch. She held me close and whispered in my ear how wonderful I was. Since I'm not wonderful, I was pretty sure this was a trap. So I figured I'd better grope her as much as I could, <laughs> as much as I could before they sprung the trap. You've got to take what you can get in this life. I read that in a magazine. So I started smearing kisses on her and pawing the front of her dress, trying to get my money's worth before somebody bashed my head in. She kept moaning, Frank, Frank, and I kept asking, What, what? Suddenly she pulled away. What's wrong, I asked. I can't do it. I was supposed to pepper you with the kisses and then knock you out on the head with a champagne bucket, but... But your better nature prevailed? No, you're just so unattractive to me. I don't care if our whole plan falls through. I'm not going to do it. I tried to be helpful. Maybe if you thought of someone else. She shook her head. I've thought of everybody else. Nothing works. I was disappointed that our date was going to be over so soon. For this I got my hair cut, I thought. But at least I hadn't fallen into any kind of trap. At that moment, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dark shape rushing towards me. Then fifty more shapes. Then more fists than you could count. More fists than there are in the rainbow. Started punching the bejesus out of me. When I woke up, I was being dragged by my feet down a long cement corridor, through metal doors, then down more corridors, always winding farther down the street. It's embarrassing being dragged like that. And yes, it scrapes your head up pretty good, too. So that makes two things wrong with it. It wasn't the best situation to find yourself in, of an evening, but I tried to stay upbeat and make the best of it. I sang a few songs, made plans for what I was going to do tomorrow, if there was a tomorrow, waved to the armed guards in the corridor, etc. I asked one of the armed guards if he could help me out. I said there was some guy dragging me by the feet, that guy with the crew cut. I suggested there might be a few bucks in it for him if he would join the Burley team. He didn't answer, probably thinking about something else. I was dragged into a big room, which I was told used to be part of our city's civil defense system, but was now owned by the Pellagra crime family. The city's rationale for selling their civil defense system was that it would save taxpayers X amount of dollars a year. They never got more specific than that, and was no longer needed. Though they admitted that in the unlikely event of a nuclear attack, the public would probably have to go screw themselves, they stressed that this was a worst-case scenario. The big room I was in was the command center, which had all sorts of viewer screens and consoles and scary-looking launch buttons, so you can conduct an entire nuclear war from in there if you wanted to. Pretty slick, I thought. Wish I had one of these. The crook who had been dragging me said they had gotten tired of trying to kill me. It was too hard for some reason. They didn't know why. I started telling them about my protective layer of fat, but he told me to shut up. He said they'd run out of ideas, so they just decided to toss me down here. Why don't you kill me now while I'm upside down, I said. I like pointing out to criminals when they're being inconsistent for their or their reasoning has some stupid flaw, but he just gave me a look that seemed to say I should s seemed to say I should mind my own business. Then he actually said I should mind my own business. So that's what that look meant. All right. He told me the crooks used this place for more than just a dumping ground for undesirables. He said they also had a lot of food stored here in case there was a, ever a nuclear war. That way they could ensure that the future, in the future there would still be criminals. 
He said they even had a selective breeding program going on down here, trying to breed the perfect criminal by crossing themselves with gorgeous showgirls. I asked how the gorgeous showgirl part helps make the criminal. Wouldn't it be better to have the women be scrawny and beady-eyed, I ventured, maybe with the face of a rat? Hey, you have your selective breeding program, we'll have ours. While he was untying my hand, straightening my jacket, and combing my hair, I pointed out that this is where the bad guys always make their big mistake, giving the good guy, that's me in this instance, all the information he needs to destroy them, letting them in on their most criminal secrets. When I escape from your clutches, you're screwed, I told him. I waited for him to blab some secrets to me, but he just left and slammed the door, so I figured now probably wasn't the time. He'd tell me later, most likely. And then he would be screwed. I looked around. I wasn't alone. There were about two dozen other prisoners in the huge room. They were looking at me curiously, but also trying to cover as much of the floor with their bodies as they could so as to lay claim to that much space. Among them I recognized a couple of honest politicians and several honest cops I'd seen around who were plainly regretting their choice of sides by now. Then I saw a geeky old guy with glasses, wearing a smock that had Professor Groggins embroidered above the pocket. I was getting sick of everybody I met being named Professor Groggins, but something told me this was the real Professor Groggins, and that something was him.